Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, it's great to be here today. It's great to see everyone in person, and I uh, appreciate everyone coming out. Um, before I forget, I want to I wanna thank everybody here for all the phone calls and all the kind words, and, and you might not know how great it is to be able to, to see this live streamed every week. And whether we're out here in the parking lot or whether we're at home or whether I'm on the road somewhere else, it's really cool to see everything at the push of a button. So I want to thank everyone in our audio department that makes that happen because it's not easy. I couldn't do it. And I could probably grab 10 of you together and we all 11 couldn't do it. So it really means a lot. A lot of people are getting to see uh, what's going on here and hear God's word. So thank you for the hard work. And I know our pastor and his family is away on vacation this week. They deserve it. Is he not doing a fantastic job here? He really is. I really, really have enjoyed his preaching and his counsel. So we have a lot to be worried about. We have a lot to stress about. But I'm going to tell you something. That's not what this message this morning is about. This message this morning is positive. It's about the future. It's about the present. It's about the promises of God. And yes, you've heard this, these verses before, and you should be really familiar with them. But I want to take us to a place today that God wants us to go to realize how blessed you and I truly are. And when you think of blessings, it might not be exactly what God's talking about in the Bible because the world has took that word blessings and they've made it sound like all kinds of different things. But we're going to learn what it's about this morning or be reminded what it's about this morning. And I want us to smile. I want us to leave with a smile on our face. Uh, some of y'all's face would break if you smiled too big. But we're going to do that today to where we can just really enjoy, enjoy God's word and, and spend some time together here today. So let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege and this honor to, to share your word with this church, with our church, with your church. I pray, God, that everything that, that is spoken is your words through me to give us the message that you would have us to hear. Thank you, Lord, for this church, these members, these friends, the family, our pastor. God, just thank you. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I really have learned the last several months to celebrate the wins and, and be happy about small things. It doesn't have to be something monumental, but, but be happy about the small things. This morning as I was drinking my coffee, I watched 13 red birds land on one feeder. I mean, that's pretty cool. I don't get to see that every day. But just little things like that reminded me that God's always trying to get our attention with things that he does for us. And so often we're just so, so busy. But, but I had something really, really cool happen to me this month. Really, really positive. Some of you guys are going to really think this is cool, and some of you might not really even understand the dynamic of it. But I think in the end you'll understand where, what I'm talking about. So... Uh, a couple months ago, my wife asked me, she's like, you're always so, so busy at work. You have so many meetings. You have to go so many places. What is it that you guys talk about so much? What, what on earth could you talk about that much? And man, I was thinking, okay, where's this going? You know, wh where's this rabbit trail leading me? I said, well, you know, we talk about work stuff. You know, we, we, we talk about game warden stuff. We talk about hunting and fishing and all the stuff we really like to do. And she's like, well, well what is it you guys really like to do? I, I, boy, I saw this opportunity. I saw this, and I said, you know what? Here we go. Honey, we just, we all love to mow. We love to mow the grass, and we talk about it all the time. We talk about the different equipment we got, you know. You know, I got that old Harsk Gvarna mower out there I've had for six years. And remember, a couple years ago, we saved up, and on the 20% off day at Tractor Supply, we went and bought that big zero-turn Cub Cadet. And I got that 1959 case tractor with the 1959 rotary mower on it. David saw me on it yesterday, putting it to it, just wearing it out. And uh, we talk about all the cool equipment we got, and, and you know what? How fun it is. We just love to mow. And we really don't want our wives to find out how fun it is to mow. And so I let that marinate for a little while, and I waited a week, and I said, honey, would, would, you, like to, would you like to mow? Would you like to try getting on that tractor, the, the big one, the little one, whatever you want? Well, I don't know. I think about it. 
A week goes by, she says, I'm, I think I might want to try to mow. All right, what, pick your poison. What do you want to get on? Well, I'll get on that little orange one. I'm like, okay. So we got it all set up, and she mows in the morning because she doesn't want to get all the dust and everything, and the allergies going. So, of course, you know you're not supposed to mow wet grass, but it's okay. We're all right with that. So she gets out there on that mower, and, man, I'm just, I'm not believing what I'm seeing. So I jump on my tractor, and I'm going at it, too, and, and, and all of a sudden, I, I see her waving at me. Okay. W what's the matter? Well, it just cut off. Okay, that's all right. Probably ran out of gas. Let me check it. I know I filled it up, but let's check the gas. Gas was fine. Did it make any funny noises, honey? Or just No, it just shut off. So I go through the whole system, you know, and, and I kind of look around. And Did you hear any loud noises or anything? And then I realize there's about 42 inches of dirt missing in the earth. And a big old piece of wood used to be yonder. And I lift up the bottom of it, and sure enough, not only does my blade look like a crescent moon, but... Uh, but I got a piece of wood chucked up in there and the spindles broke off and all that. But you know what? That ain't enough to get me upset because she's out there mowing with me. So I said, honey, it ain't no problem. We'll get it fixed. We'll get the parts ordered and we'll come on in and we'll get it going again. So a couple weeks went by and now we're about three weeks ago. And, and I said, honey, that orange mower ain't fixed yet. What do you think about that zero turn? Would you like to try to learn to drive that zero turn? Sure, I'll try. And so I got her out there and we got on that zero turn and she uh she flagged me down hey it just cut off it just cut off well okay well now i'm a little wiser so i'm kind of looking around you know what do we hit it's okay we can fix it and uh i don't know i i, I might have hit a little stick and boy i pulled up underneath that hood and there was a stick the size of my arm and it was so wrapped up on those blades that it stopped 200 miles an hour of rpm and just shut that bad boy down but you know what it is okay. We can fix that kind of thing. So my wife has been mowing the property with me. And my, my friend Paul over there, we love to mow, don't we, Paul? Paul? Paul got asked one time, how long does it take you to finish mowing your property, Paul? And he said, I don't know. I ain't never finished. <laughs> about November, right, Paul? That's about when we're finished. But it was interesting uh, she, she came to me after that, after we got through mowing and she said, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure we got the right equipment for the David Whitfield. She said, if we're going to do this right, we got to get the right equipment. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, howdy, what is going on? The right equipment. What are you thinking, honey? Well, you know, those big commercial mowers, you know, like one of them John Deere commercial mowers or Kubota commercial mowers. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm going to have to wait till that 50% coupon comes out for one of them. But she's like, no, I'm serious. We need to get a commercial setup so we can mow this property the right way. And I looked at her square in the eye. And I said, who are you and what have you done with my wife? <laughs> You're not supposed to say that, guys, when, when they're helping you out like that. So a, a couple weeks go by and yesterday evening we were about to go to bed. And she said, hey, uh, I want to ask you something. That's code for what, guys? Uh, I guess code for here comes a project. You're not doing something right or whatever. So I'm ready for it. Okay, what do you want to ask me, honey? She said, uh, I was wondering, would, would you like to learn how to drive that Kenmore canister vacuum cleaner? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a selfish person. I want you to have all that fun by yourself. <laughs> so I said that just to get us smiling this morning because we got a lot to be thankful for. And we're going to be looking in God's Word this morning and we're going to be looking in the Luke chapter 6. I hope you got your Bibles this morning because we're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture. There's no better way to preach God's Word than to read God's Word because it's all in there. We just have to dig in there a little bit and figure out what it is we're supposed to do. You know, the longer I live, the more likely I truly understand uh, what's really important in life. And I think you do too. I think we recognize things that happen to us in our lives, and our lives are up and down, and we have peaks and valleys, and it might not be what it looked like when we were in high school, uh, the vision that we had for our own lives. Things change, but I really think that we know what's more important than other things. And to know what true blessings are, and that they only come from God the Father. That's where our true blessings actually come from. So today we're going to dig into the portion of the Sermon on the Mount. 
And in Matthew, we've heard the Sermon of the Mount preached many times and taught many times. But we're going to be looking in Luke in just a minute. And it actually is titled the Sermon on the Plateau or the Sermon on the Plain. But before we get into Matthew and before we get into Luke, I'm just going to throw a disclaimer out there. Uh, this may be contrary to some uh, folks who study the Bible and, and view it one way and view it the other way. I don't believe God's word contradicts itself in any verse of Scripture in the Holy Bible. I think it supports one another. And to say that the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew is not the Sermon on the Plateau or very close in time topic and understanding and meaning I think is wrong and I don't want to preach it from that platform. I want to preach it saying this is the same event. These are so close in time that they're, if they're not the exact same moment, they're within hours or maybe even days. But I want to read first in Matthew what you're most familiar with. Matthew chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. Matthew chapter 5 and, and verses 3 through 12. Just hold on. This is what you've heard many times. Jesus speaking, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You've heard that many times, haven't you? You're very, very familiar with, with the Sermon on the Mount. But here we have Luke. Man, I really like Luke a lot. Luke is really, really, really cool. And I, I like Luke for many reasons. One was he was the beloved physician. We know that. But did you also know that he was really considered a, a phenomenal historian? He really, really took time to document God's word from a, a perspective that, that was given to him by, yes, God the Father, but also from, from let me just read this to you, uh, in the beginning of Luke, um, the very beginning of his gospel, one, the first four verses, this is Luke speaking. He says, For as much as many have taken in the hand to set forth in order a declaration of these things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which was from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order most Theopolis. He took time to research to study, to understand the events of Christ before he wrote all this down. So it wasn't just something he thought was supposed to be done. This is something that he knew God wanted him to do. He researched, he worked, he paid attention to detail. And if I asked you about the New Testament and I said, who wrote most of the New Testament? We're going to say what? Paul? All right. I have a couple smiles out there. But I want you to look at that this week. By volume, who wrote the most of the New Testament? If you add Luke and Acts together, you're going to be surprised. So let me know next week what you find out. So, we're going to switch now over to Luke's version. And the thing that folks get caught up on is, is in chapter 6 of Luke, before we get into the Beatitudes, uh, we're going to look here just for a second up here. Um, at verse 17, it says, And he came down with them and stood in the plain in the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear and to be healed of their diseases. So, so many people get caught up on, well, I thought in Matthew it says they went up on the mountain. And, and here it says he came down to a plateau for the Sermon of the Mount. I'm just going to beg you to, to just, just bear with me today and understand this is the same events that's going on. So Luke talks about the Beatitudes in verse, verse 20 through, I think we're going to go through 26 today. But I want us to understand who's the audience? Who is it that Luke's actually uh, saying Jesus is addressing 
and the Beatitudes down on the plateau. It says that the multitudes followed him. So we're talking about a large group. We're not talking about a small group of people of just the disciples. Yes, he specifically was talking to the, the disciples, the apostles. But there's three main groups here that's, that Jesus is talking to. Number one was the 12 disciples, the apostles. Number two was, was the uncommitted, curious crowd. And part of that uncommitted, curious crowd were the religious leaders of the day. Those who thought they had it all figured out and were there just to see what Jesus was going to say, maybe to trip him up, maybe to challenge him. And then there were the followers of Christ. The followers of Christ that recognized him as the Savior of the world, followers of Christ who were still trying to figure it out, is this truly the Messiah who is talking to us? So those three groups of people sound very similar to the groups that we have in the church today, doesn't it? You know, we have those who are 100% sold out. We have those who are, are trying to figure it out. And then we have some that just, uh, uh, we, could, we could say, well, you know, they claim this, but they do this. So we have the same types of groups here. So I believe that the, the word that Jesus was sharing at the Sermon on the Mount that Luke recorded is the word that he has for us this day, today. And I think that it's important that we pay attention to that. So, I want to help you understand that we're going to read some things that really, in our logical thought process, might not make sense. And I want to read to you a small portion here of MacArthur's commentary. Miss Martha, thanks for helping me find these a long time ago. They're so, so wonderful. But it talks about how Jesus' thinking is so different than everyone else's. It says, The teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ is diametrically opposed to human thinking. Diametrically opposed to human thinking. Most of the Jewish people, particularly the religious leaders, found it repugnant, offensive, and threatening. Have you heard that before? Does our world think that it's repugnant, offensive, and threatening? Some people do. They still do. In their minds, it was so wrong that it had to be satanic. That was recorded in Mark 3. Then and now, the Lord's teaching shatters popular worldviews. It challenges men's motives. It turns the world upside down and stands their thinking on its head. It makes no attempt at political correctness and ignores conventional wisdom. That has to ring true to this day and help us understand that what we're going to read at face value might not be very easily easy to understand, but we're going to break it down so we know what Christ is talking about. So in this particular part of the Beatitudes, his message was shocking to some. It outraged some. The self-righteous religious leaders, uh, uh, they they didn't understand what the Savior was saying. This wasn't the Savior they were expecting. So they can't, he can't be right. This couldn't be really the Christ. So one more point before we get started in, in reading Scripture here and Luke's account. What does blessed really mean? When we say blessed are ye, blessed is ye in the Beatitudes, what are we talking about? Well, in its simplest form, that translates to the word what? Happy happy and and we know that that happy is an emotion we know that happy is is largely dependent upon who on you on me on our attitude i tell my granddaughter all the time our attitude determines our altitude so we have a lot to do with our own personal happiness but but is that all blessed really means is it just being happy no because we just mentioned that happiness is temporary it's temporal. So is it wrong to be happy? Of course it's not wrong to be happy. But, but what Jesus is talking about is not temporary. What he's talking about here is eternity. He's talking about eternal happiness. So what is eternal happiness? We're going to find out in just a minute. But for a second, I just want us to know that it's okay to be happy. It's okay to smile a lot. It's okay to smile when things are bad. It's okay to have a positive outlook, but it's something that's a learned behavior. Not everyone was born with an optimistic personality. 
I was not. I was born with the opposite type of personality. I would figure out very quickly why something wasn't going to work because this is going to happen. I look at things from a more realistic standpoint. Well, we can't do this because that will happen. And, and sometimes I rob myself of being happy over something that I should have been happy about. And I don't know if anyone can actually relate with me on that. But it is a choice. So let's dive in here and look at verse 20. Verse 20, chapter 6 of Luke. It says, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men... Oh, let me stop right there on verse 21. Let me repeat verse 21. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. Certainly here, and I mentioned this earlier, that, the, that, that Luke, the beloved physician, would have been in tune with the poor, with the needy, with the hungry, with the desolate. He would have seen all of these people. He would have, have, have had to practice on all of these people. He would have been in tune with all of them. But I don't really think that's what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here specifically is a heart condition. What is the heart condition of those who are poor? Remember what we read earlier in Matthew? What did it say in the same verse? The poor in what? The poor in spirit. That's what we're referring to here, the poor in spirit. And that's what he's talking about. Jesus is, excuse me, Jesus is speaking only those who recognize their poor spiritual condition. This actually translates to bankruptcy. Their spiritual bankruptcy. Being at the bottom rung of the ladder. Being at the bottom of the barrel and looking up. Recognizing that I and of myself, my spiritual condition is broken. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is not a message about do's and don'ts. Do this and you'll get that. It's a message of salvation. Salvation has to be the forefront thought process in our head because that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. So, do you have a spirit? Have you had a spirit of bankruptcy? Well, one day, I imagine most everyone here in this congregation recognized that they needed a Savior, and they were broken. And they realized at that moment in their life, I'm spiritually bankrupt. I have nothing to give, and I need someone to save me. That is the condition that Luke is talking about right here. Most of us in here were at that point. We recognized that point, and we cried out to Jesus to save us. Some are still contemplating that. Some are still thinking about that. But that's what Christ is saying. Blessed are those who recognize their spiritual brokenness. Blessed are those that recognize they need a Savior. And that's what we're talking about here. Yours is the kingdom of God, present and future. If you notice the word in verse 20, it says, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Both now and in the future, the kingdom of God belongs to those individuals who have claimed Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So what do we mean when we say, the kingdom of God. What does that mean? So what's the first thing that pops in our mind when we hear something about the kingdom of God? We automatically think of heaven, right? Well, let's, let's look over at Romans. Just one verse. Romans 14. If you want to turn over there, you can. If not, it's just one verse. I'll read it to you. Romans 14, verse 17, talks about the kingdom of God. And to put this in context, they were just talking about being unified not arguing over silly things and getting along, not being stumbling blocks, but all being in unity and that Christ is the only judge. And this is what it says, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Remember they were arguing about what you could eat and what you couldn't. He says that's not what it is. This is what the kingdom of God is. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of God is. And for us, that means that we can have that now. That righteousness through Christ is what we can live now. That peace, that joy through the Holy Spirit is what we can have now 
no matter the circumstances that surround us. What does that sound like to you? What does the kingdom of, of, of God sound like when we describe it that way? It sounds like the fruit of the Spirit to me. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. We're talking about peace and joy. We're talking about righteousness. We're talking about needing to do this through the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean in simple terms? Righteousness. Being made right. Right living. Because of Christ. He made us right. How about that peace? Don't we all want that peace? Don't we all want that joy? That peace really means contentment. Being content. Understanding that God is in control. And, and I had it explained one time like this. A person who has peace in their heart stresses, but it's different. Stress is the absence of peace. Think about this. Stress, when we get stressed out in life, when things just drive us up the wall, when we lay in bed at night and that topic pops in our head, whatever it is we're worried about, and hours go by, and we're just laying there in bed thinking about it, that is stress. And it is the absence of peace. However, peace is not the absence of stress. Peace is knowing how to handle it by saying, God, I need you to take this. That's the difference. And He will take that from us. Now, that's also a learned behavior, folks. Some of us worry. Some of us stress out over things. Some of us haven't accepted the blessings that God is saying, these are yours. All you have to do is proclaim that you understand what these blessings are and where they come from, and I'm going to take care of it for you. He didn't say, I'm going to make it just how you want it to be, and then you can relax. He says he'll take care of it, and that we are blessed, and that we can live a life of righteousness, of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So again, in verse 21, we talked about those who hunger now will be filled, and those who weep now uh, will laugh. You're going to. So those who have an intense, think about this if you know this person, they have an intense, deep, all-consuming longing for acceptance by, not the world, God. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about Someone who wants to be accepted by God. Someone who wants to please God. Someone who wants to make sure that their life is controlled by God. Someone who is not worried about what everyone else thinks, but they want to make sure God is happy with the life that they're living. That's what we're talking about here. That's the specific. To give you an example, many of you have read a lot that David has written. A lot of the Psalms he has written. He really puts this in really good perspective of what we're talking about here in Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That's the type of attitude Jesus is talking about here, being blessed. Those who hunger for His Word. Those who hunger for the life He has for us. We shall be filled now what does that mean we shall be filled it literally means that you will be so uh, so filled up that you will not have want wants it means that you will be so filled that your spirit will be overflowing that you will just be just oozing out the love that christ has for each and every one of us by now you should be thinking to yourself hmm wow these are these are some pretty powerful verses here and, you know, I'm supposed to be that child of God that Jesus is talking about here. You know, as I was studying this and as I was reading this and I was preparing this message, I realized, man, I, I, I got some improvements to make. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what Jesus says. These are the ones who are blessed. And I wonder what's going on. And those who weep. Those who weep, those who have, have, have recognized their sinful condition and they mourn at their personal lack of a relationship with the Savior. They recognize that in their heart they cannot live without Him. They recognize that, that sin fills their life not just once, not just twice, but constantly that sin is there in our lives and we have to understand that, that we have to accept that, we have to repent from that, we have to confess that from God and we have to promise we're not going to act that way anymore. Those are us. Those are the ones that we're talking about here. 
when we're weeping. And not just go through the motions of that, but to actually do something about it and make that change. Laughing. We talked about laughing. What that means here is freedom. Freedom in Christ. What that means here is relief from guilt. Not having the, the this is what you were. This is what you did. This is what you said. This isn't what that's about. Forgiven. How does that sound? Freedom in Christ. Relief from guilt. And forgiven. Those are the characteristics of a believer. That's what Jesus is saying here in the Sermon on the Mount. These are the ones that will be blessed. These are the ones that will be blessed. We are so fortunate to be in the group that Jesus says you will be blessed. Peace and joy and righteousness. Those are the things that we all should long for each and every day, even if we have to make that attitude adjustment. Verse 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil, not because of something you've done, not because of something you've said, but for the Son of Man's sake. You know, oftentimes I've heard criticisms come my way, come other people's ways, when you talk about a topic. And could you imagine if I stood up, I don't know, in Walmart on the loudspeaker, Costco on the loudspeaker at work, and I read this, and I said, blessed are these folks, but cursed are these folks. You know, I'd be tarred and feathered. You would too. But, but those aren't my words. Those aren't your words. We're living this life of Christ, and we're not telling other people that you have to do this or else Greg's going to do something about it. That's not what we're saying. But sometimes you're proven guilty by association. If you're going to live your life for Christ, folks, people are going to recognize that. Sometimes it's great and it's wonderful and you have that immediate connection. Other times it's not because Jesus warns us that that's going to happen. And he tells us that we're blessed for doing that. So what are we supposed to do about it? In verse 23, what does it say? It says, Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers do unto the prophets. Rejoice when that happens. And again, I say rejoice. Remember earlier I told you that Jesus' way of thinking is not the same as man's way of thinking? I'll be honest with you. I've experienced that in the last couple of years. And I'll be honest with you. I didn't rejoice. I didn't think it was great. I didn't do what God said I was supposed to do in this final beatitude. And I know that. And I know what it says in Scripture about that we've not been promised an easy life. I understand all of that. But Jesus is telling us to rejoice. Why? Why is He telling us to rejoice? Because we are to remember that we're children of God and that He is in control. And it doesn't matter what everyone else says or does. Your eternity is in Him. It's not in your buddy. It's not in your boss. It's not in your neighbor. It's not in all these other folks that we sometimes try to impress. It's all lands on Him. And He is here to bless us in this life with joy and peace and happiness and righteousness. And folks, let me tell you something. If you haven't figured it out, this is the hardest part of your life you're ever going to have to live because eternity doesn't have any of the stuff that we deal with here in this world. It will be absolutely glorious. Oh, so many times I just long to hear that trumpet blast. I strain with my hearing. Lord, here it comes, but I know I won't have to strain even with my poor hearing. We will have no doubt when that happens. So we are to rejoice when we're hated, when we're mocked, when words that you didn't say are spread in a rumor, when someone makes something up about your belief that isn't true, to make themselves look better, he says that we are to rejoice. John 16.33 says this, 
Jesus said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace. There's that word again. I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Any of you have trials and sorrows? Which week, brother? We have them. But take heart because what? I have overcome the world. You see, the one that we love as our Lord and Savior says, don't worry about it. Give it to me. I got this. I got you covered. The world has nothing on me. They crucified me. They mocked me. They lied about me. They beat me. And I died on the cross, Greg, for your sins. For all of your sins, I died on the cross. And you know what? He overcame the world because he rose from the dead three days later. Now, the tough part in this message. The last point. Verses 24 through 26. It starts out with the word, but. In this particular B-U-T, it's a strong adversative conjunction. What that means is, we're going from this topic, and we're doing a 180 degree about face, and we're talking about this topic. We're getting away from the blessed part of it now, and now we're talking about the cursed part of this. This is a side of, of the conversation that Christ is having that we don't want to be on. Verse 24 through 26 says, But woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now, we've been taught this enough that we know when Christ says, Woe unto you that are rich, we're not talking about the wealthy. We're not talking about those who have a lot of material things because there's countless people in the Bible that I can show you that were considered wealthy, that were men and women of God. That's not what this warning is about. Rather, what he's talking about here is those who in and of themselves think they're righteous on their own. They think they have got it all figured out. Those who are full, that doesn't mean the ones who went to the all-you-can-eat buffet at the old Golden Corral. We're talking about the ones that, that, that think that they can meet their own needs and they have no use or need of a Savior in Jesus Christ. They think they've got it all together and whoa, they're doing it all right themselves. They know what they're supposed to do. There's no better example of that than Luke 18. You, you've, you've heard this, but I just want to give you an understanding of what Christ is talking about here. This is the person that Christ is talking about. These woes are going towards an individual like this. Luke 18, 11 and 12 says this, Christ speaking. You've heard this parable. You're familiar with it. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast not once, but twice a week. I give tithes of not just my income, but everything that I possess. That's the woe is me person. Now that's kind of an extreme in our world, and as we live today, I understand. But you know that there are self-proclaimed believers that say they know the way to heaven, and they know how to get there. And unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. Th laugh. Those who believe they have it all figured out themselves, sadly, everyone we talked about in this aforementioned group, believe that they will go to heaven, believe that they will be blessed, believe that they are living their life for God, believe that they are living life for others, but they will never receive God's reward. Thank God, some way, somehow, I was convinced by an old Southern Baptist in a little town of Interlochen, Florida, that that was not the life I wanted to live because for many, many years I did. And I was on the wrong side of this scripture. And I know you were too. But folks, remember that we don't just celebrate victory in our own lives, but we have a purpose to share our lives with others, to share God's words with others, 
and to show other people that there's a better way to live. Peace and joy are given only through the Holy Spirit. Scripture says that. Peace and joy are only given through the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? Does that mean that non-believers can't have it all together? Does that mean that they can't be happy? Does that mean that they can't this, this, and this? No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is internal peace, joy under all circumstances, understanding that Christ has got it. He can handle your problem this week. He can handle your problem that's so insurmountable you cannot find a solution in your own head. He understands what's going on in your life as an individual. What if I said this morning, we're going to have a time of testimony and I'm going to give every one of you 30 seconds to come up here and tell us the horrible things that you're dealing with in your life. The horrible things that you've done in your life. The horrible things that you've experienced at the hands of other people. We all could come up here and tell an example or tell a story or testify that yes, I've got one of those. Some of us could stand up and testify for the next three hours that this is what's happened in my life. And woe is me. But Christ is telling us that's not the life you have been designated to live. You have been designated to live a life of blessings, of peace and joy through righteousness. I don't know about you and all these things. I think I know what you're thinking. That's the life that I want to live. That's the life that I want to live when we have a deadly disease, a pandemic going around the world. That's the life I want to live when, when things just don't seem to be going my way. That's the life I want to live when I'm stumbling and falling and messing up time after time after time. That's the life that we all want to live. If you can claim today that Jesus Christ is your Savior, you have nothing to be afraid about. You have nothing to worry about. And yes, I know that that's much easier said than done. In closing, I'm going to read something to you. I don't want you to turn to it in your Bibles. I just want you to focus. We'll be done here in three minutes. A godly pastor in a little town of Eastman, Georgia, sent this to a godly woman that's a friend of my wife, my godly wife, and my godly wife sent this to me this week. And the timing is perfect. I didn't plan on using this in the message this morning, but when I read it, I thought it's what we needed to hear. So, focus. Here we go. Listen to this and then I'll tell you where it's from. It's about 16 verses, so just be patient. It's really, really good. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every deadly disease. He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of night nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for He will order His angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. That is Psalm 91. That was written a long, long time ago. And you might say, well, Greg, I've had disease in my family. I've had bad things happen. 
I've had this and I've had that. Brothers and sisters, we all have. And we're still here. And every single one of you can testify this morning that God has saved your life many, many times. Allow Him to protect you. Allow Him to shelter you with His wings. Have faith in Him that no matter what happens tomorrow or the next day or the next day, that you put your trust in Him because He truly knows what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You are blessed. I am blessed. We are blessed. We should be living like it. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Your Word this morning. God, forgive us when we live a life that isn't a blessed life. You've done everything for us. You've laid out the road map. You've explained to us what we have to do to live that life. But Father, You know our hearts. You know our lives. You know that oftentimes we get caught up in all this stuff and we forget. Thank You for Your reminder this morning. Thank You, Lord, for Your words and the Sermon on the Mount. Thank You, God, for a broken heart and a heart that's been saved and been made whole through Your righteousness. We love You so very much. And we thank You for this church body. We thank You for our pastor. We thank You for our loved ones. We thank You for seeing us through this pandemic. And God, I ask that You will comfort those who have lost their loved ones and families and friends through all of this. And that You will show them, Lord, that You are here with them and for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.